Tiles that we have here and what a gift it is that we have as many as we do here in Maine. All right, Paul. Well, uh, the floor is yours, my friend. Take it away. Very good. Well, this is we're coming up on, a, on an extremely big night. Uh, the big night is when the amphibians are on the move to find their mating pools, also known as vernal pools or roadside ditches of water or, or, or different pools of water for them to mate and then uh, lay their eggs. And so we're headed into that and we're gonna talk a little bit about what the big night is, what the importance of the big night, and then we're gonna identify several of the species of amphibians and reptiles that we find here in the state of Maine. So, with that, the amphibians are on the move. So what and when is the big night for amphibians? A lot of us have heard about them. So they usually occur on the night. This is gonna be a particular night when thousands of amphibians move at the same time to mate and lay their eggs. It's a mass, a mass migration from their winter uh, hibernation sites into the vernal pools to be able to, to mate and lay their eggs. It usually occurs on the first warm, rainy night in late winter or early spring. And as I was talking earlier to Alice and Jerry, we had a, almost a false big night last week when the temperatures got in the high temperatures of, of 40 to 50 degrees during the day. And then we had an all day rain and we thought we might have a big night early in March, but it turned out to be false. It's the, the ground was still too frozen for them to want to leave their, their hibernation sites. But again, the term big night is a little misleading because it isn't a particular night. It's several nights over a month, month and a half. And so again, this is when our amphibian friends are, are on their way, crossing roads, trying to look for their vernal pool, and so this night occurs over several, over the next month and a half. So why should we even care about the big night? Or why should we even care about amphibians? As I shared with you earlier, my capstone project centered around a species that I was somewhat familiar with as a child and growing up that I knew what a frog was and I knew this, but I didn't know how critical of a role that they play here for all of us. So the big night is critical to the survival of many species of amphibians. The amphibians play a key role in reducing the number of insects that destroy crops and transmit diseases. They are also a good food source for larger mammals and tadpoles are consumed by fish, snakes, turtles, birds, and other wildlife. So they keep the cycle of life going. I used to say we live in in harmony, if we want to live with our wildlife, we have to live in harmony. And now I've come to realize it isn't harmony, but it, we have to live in balance. And that's exactly what our amphibians are doing. They're keeping the balance in check for us. So the, but import, more importantly, the amphibians are great indicators of environmental health and they contribute to humanity. They also provide vital biomedicine, including compounds that are being refined for allergies, antibiotics, stimulants for heart attacks, and treatment for diverse diseases, including depression, stroke, seizures, Alzheimer's, and cancer. So again, why should we care? Well, salamanders, have, salamanders in particular have often been described as a canary in the coal mine. As, as we're all growing up, and I grew up in Western Pennsylvania in what we call coal country. And so well before that, they used to use canaries in the coal mine. And if the canary would pass away, they knew that the air condition, the air was no longer suitable for, for human habitation. And this is what we're finding out now. The salamanders are great indicators that if, if we're, you're blessed with uh, an abundance of salamanders, that means your ecosystem is very healthy. It means your water source is good. That means that the, that the forest is good. That means that we're taking good care of them. But they are particularly important for the role in the food web. As I mentioned earlier, 
They consume a lot of the insects that play a very vital role in their carbon dioxide regulators. But they're also great for sub keeping predators and, and food hawks and, and owls and herons all alive. They keep that cycle of life going. So what do I mean when the New York Times says they're also great for climate change heroes? I mean, we've heard lately in the news how much the controversy is over windmills and everything that man's trying to do to reduce the climate warming that we're facing. But nature has already tackled that program by, by the likes of even the amphibians. They, they are great at carbon dioxide regulators. What I'm trying to say is, they will, because of their nature, will consume leaf eating uh, insects or, or predators such as ants or beetles or so on. So what that's doing is it's giving our leaves and our trees a fighting chance to produce leaves that will take the carbon dioxide out of the air and, re and replace it with oxygen. If we don't keep those insects in check, then what's gonna happen is we're gonna have deforestation. And with that, we're gonna have an increase in carbon dioxide going up into the air instead of being regulated back into the earth. And so we're gonna have a massive thing. You may not think that they play that important role in the scope of things, but we, we have already screwed up our environment with emitting as much carbon dioxide as we already have. It's great to see nature is trying to assist us and helping us. So the problem, Oftentimes, amphibians have to cross roads in order to reach their breeding habitat. We we have cut right down through the center of vernal pools. We have filled in vernal pools. We have uh, destroyed uh, the forest and habitats. And because they are so small, and because they're traveling at night in poor weather, because they like amphibians, have to have wet, moist area around them, because that's how they regulate their temperature, they, they have to stay moist. So you're not, that's why you're not gonna see them on a hot summer evening crossing over, but you're gonna see them go out when it's raining. So they're extremely hard to see. And death rates on roads can approach 100% in areas with high traffic. And because of this, amphibians may be decreasing in significantly in some areas. So again, what can we do? Too often, as I've sat through presentations like this, I've heard the doom and the gloom. Everybody's saying, hey, there's nothing we could do. Global warming's here. We're going to lose this. We're going to lose that. But there are a handful of dedicated individuals across the state that are, are doing their utmost to assure that we don't lose these amphibians and reptiles. One of them is Greg LeClaire. Greg LeClaire is presently a graduate student at the University of Maine, but he's also the Maine Big Night Project Coordinator. Um, and then he's saying that amphibians crossing the road to get to their vernal poles may face up to 100% road loss. Though usually it's an average of 21% of amphibians are killed by cars when they're attempting to cross the road. So Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife offer a few suggestions and then along with Greg offer what we can do to ensure their safety, which is what we're all hoping because Alice is gonna share with you at the end of this presentation some very exciting news, how you, become, you can become a main citizen science and participate in a big night program if you like. So first of all, we need to protect these vernal pools. They play in a very important role. And I've mentioned vernal pools several times, but a lot of us may not know what it is. So a vernal pool is a seasonal forested pool of water. These are small wetlands provided by a unique habitat for special amphibians, invertebrates and other wildlife. They're not, they don't necessarily, they have no inlets, no outlets, they have no fish. That's the way that these amphibians have picked them out because they're not gonna be consumed by fish or whatever. So this is, um, these are seasonal, so they may only last a few months after the warmer weather comes. So that's why it's quick to do it. So again, what can we do? Well, one, we can become a volunteer in Maine's Big Night program. And the Maine Big Night program was a, created as a direct result of absorbing 
the impact of roads having on amphibians uh, population. So again, what is, uh, what is the Big Night Project? Well, that's where we as citizens can participate in a project led by the volunteers and specialists from UMaine. And we can help identify crossing sites and relieve pressure from the road deaths at the same time. So what are the goals of the Big Night Program? The project has three main goals. Identify significant and vulnerable routes for amphibians across the state of Maine. Provide direct relief of road deaths to local amphibian population. And what do we mean by that? Well, on a big, big night participation, what you're gonna be doing is you're gonna be outfitted in a safety vest, headlamp, flashlight, uh, you're going to go into an area where you may be requested to slow down cars traveling through that area. And then you may see uh, a frog or a salamander attempting to cross the road and you may lend some assistance in getting them to the other side so they can get into the vernal pools. And you can also, this also creates an opportunity as I had mentioned several times, you can become a main citizen to participate in a very valuable and critical wildlife conservation program. And again, as I said, everything seems to have doom and gloom, but the hope is, according to the Big Night program, headed by Greg LeClaire again, 2020 was the biggest season yet. I think a lot of us can figure out why that was because it occurred about the same time that the entire state of Maine shut down. When the entire state of Maine shut down, road traffic shut down tremendously, and so it gave them a fighting chance to get across the road. That could be one contributing factor. The second part of it is a lot of people were looking for things to do outside because they didn't want to be restricted to inside. And the Big Night program is an excellent way to keep safety distance of six feet, uh, wear your mask, and be outside enjoying the fresh air. So they studied, studied over 105 different sites throughout the state. What they came up with is the volunteers surveyed for over 104 hours in total between mid-March and May 1st. And what they found was they collected data on 1,743 amphibians, of which 1,395 were alive, 333 unfortunately had passed away, 15 were injured, but that number of 1,395 was doubled from the study they did a year ago in 2019. So through their efforts, they were able to double the amount walking or getting across the road safely. So again, the big night. Here are some interesting things to, when we go out and we start to participate in the big night. Remember, spring peepers and wood frogs get moving before the salamanders do. And it's also weather dependent. Hmm. I think we've lost um, Paul for a minute here. Oh dear. <laughs> I'll have to text him. Well, while we're waiting for um for Paul to come back. Um, Alice, I want to let everybody know that uh, I experienced the big night in Vermont last week. Uh, it's a little warmer there than it is here in Maine. Um, but I saw pictures of the salamanders and frogs and toads that uh, were making their way to a, a vernal pool. And it, it was absolutely spectacular if you get a chance to be a part of a big night somewhere where you live, 
don't miss that opportunity because it's really, really neat. Yeah. Let's see. Um, well, I have Paul's, <laughs> I have a slideshow, but I'm sure he's going to come back. Uh, that's the thing about, that's why they're working on internet. Uh, whoop, there he is. Paul, are you there? Paul, hello. Okay. Paul, this is a big night for you. This is your big night. Please come back. I got a um, call from Paul and he's just had a power outage and he is on a generator, a backup generator. So he's trying to get back on. Okay. Um, I can share, uh, oh. I can tell you about when we're, uh, we're gonna be, whoops. Yeah, we've got tentative plans for big nights uh, here in the area, Alice, right? Yes, I just, uh, here you are. I just lost you here. Uh, we will be doing a, a, some uh, a, two big night brigades, <laughs> one on uh, April 4th and another one on April 22nd. Um, so what, if you would like to participate, uh, you should just, um, you can use, and I'll show this at the end of the show, but uh, you can just email me at info at friendsoftauntonbay.org and I'll send you more, I'll send you all the details rather than, uh, but basically it's as uh, Paul said and, and Jerry that, each person has to have a, uh, a reflective vest. I do have a few of those that I got from um, Blue Hill Heritage Trust and a flashlight, a headlamp. And, uh, oh, there's Paul. Good, you're back, Paul. So, um, but we have to control the number of people. So that's why I'm having you go through me. <laughs> And of course, it's all weather dependent. Uh, it's got to be a certain temperature, uh, roughly above forty-five degrees. It's got to be. Uh, it's got to be. Yeah, we just set. Wet. We set some dates. Uh, yeah. We may uh, change. I, I set one early so that we have a, a time to um, do it. It's like a reverse rain date. If it's not raining, we may right. reschedule it. Right. <laughs> Paul, are you back? Oh, he's oh, not, he's, he needs to be, uh, he needs to put his, um, okay, it's a, it's a screen goes. back, yeah, a presentation yeah, we back can up. hear you, we can hear you, can you hear it? yes, can you see it, yeah, okay, great, yeah, okay, I, I apologize, I have very little to do with the weather, but we see, I am, I am talking to you from Addison, Maine. We are right on the shoreline of the Woho Bay, and we are being hit and hammered all day long with gusts up to 40 to 50 miles an hour. And I guess this last one just took out a tree, so, so I apologize for that. So anyhow, I, if I recall, we are right here, and let me get rid of we are right here and doubling the number of amphibians surviving. So that's the importance, that's the hope surrounding uh, the efforts that we all put into the big night. Um, so that's good news. So again, remember spring peepers and wood frogs get moving before the salamanders do. They don't necessarily have to have the wet rainy night to be able to do this. Frogs only live for approximately about three years. So 
their whole purpose is be born and, and mate, be born and mate, be born and mate. And so they may not have to wait for the conditions to be just right like salamanders do. So again, it's weather dependent. Frogs due to their short lifespan, about three years, will not, will try to even breed on, on ground that is dry. While salamanders, because of their skin, requires wet conditions to emerge from their winter hibernation sites, will require that rainy night. So again, let's take a look at some of the opportunities, look at our, some of our friends that we might come across on a big night uh, stroll. Here we have a spring peeper. These are, spring peepers are found in almost any mixed forest, woodlands, near ponds, marshes, and swamps. I think we've all agreed that they are common and widespread throughout the state of Maine. They are Maine's smallest frog, only about an inch to an inch and a half long, and one of two tree frogs found in the state of Maine. They are the unmistakably the first sign of spring has sprung, and they are the first to breed in early mid to early to mid April. Uh, I think so many of us are relieved when we can hear the spring peepers out at night when we take a stroll. And peepers, believe it or not, are, are only one of only five species of North American frogs that can freeze and survive. Again, this is one of those unique characteristics that we have with these, these amphibians is the fact that right now scientists are studying that ability to why they are able to get the antifreeze within their system, be able to freeze up to 80% of their body, survive, and be able to do it. So males make the high pitch bell-like sound um, and, and may call up to 15 to 25 times per minute. A chorus of peepers can be heard up to a half a mile away. And it's like anybody else, those who sing the loudest and the longest, the male spring peepers will usually get the mate with the female. So again, and some other interesting tidbits about the spring peeper. Um, they are, the males have a dark throat and the females have a lighter colored throat. And they are best place to look for them if you're out looking for them. It's gonna be along a wet area, uh, a vernal pool-like area, but where there are trees and shrubs that are standing in or near the water. And their breeding territory, these are males territory, defined male territory. So they're only, four to 16 inches in diameter. That's what a, a, a male uh, spring peeper will protect is approximately that. So right now in the state of Maine, they're least concerned, but let's give a listen to what a spring peeper might sound like. Okay, here's a wood frog. This is the second species that you may come across when you're out on your big night program. Uh, we're gonna come across either spring peepers. This is a, a good chance you're gonna come up across a wood frog. And wood frogs are usually, they stay in the forest. They, and the only time they come out is when they go to the breeding season in the summer. But it, it, during the summer, they prefer cold, moist woods where they are active during the day and night. So in the winter, they will hibernate under decaying or rotten litter in the woods. They're common throughout the state of Maine. A wood frog's life expectancy in the wild, again, is, is up to about three years. They're one of Maine's smaller uh, frogs, exceeding no more than two to, two to two and a half inches long. Wood frogs are one of the first to breed and are explosive breeders. Um, and scientists are studying the adapt mechanism of wood frogs to discover new ways and better ways of preserving human organ, donated organs for transplant. How can we take that harvested organ out of that human and transport port it across the country or across the world? And they're looking at the ways that these wood frogs hibernate and be able to freeze up to 80% of their bodies to be able to, to figure out a better way of doing it. And they sound like a duck quacking with limited carrying power and can seldom be heard far from the pond. 
So right now they're least concerned in the state of Maine. And there are several classifications that the state of Maine will give. Some could be least concerned, some could be endangered and so on. Uh, right now, when it says least concerned, there, there is a concern for them, but it's not as high priority as some of the others, such as a leopard frog or, or a mink frog or some of the others. To me, that sounds like a duck quacking. Uh, the good old American toad. Here's a trivial question for you. How many different types of toads are there in the state of Maine? Well, one. We only have one toad in the entire state of Maine. It's called the American toad, which virtually lives in every habitat except for saltwater. They're common and widespread, widespread throughout the state of Maine. And they range anywhere from two to four inches. Females a little bit larger than males. And the breeding season, again, starts now in April, and it will last till May. And one American toad can eat up to 1,000 insects every day. And their calls can last up to 30 seconds or more. This is what you hear on those warm spring nights. And right now, they're least concerned as well. And you can hear the spring peepers in the background. So another, if you have the great opportunity to come across one of these, these are the blue spotted salamanders. They are found throughout the state of Maine, but not as, not as frequently as say the spotted salamander. After breeding season, they will disperse into the woods area where they will seek shelter by burrowing under rocks, rotting stumps, logs, mats of moss, and various debris. They're one of the mole salamanders. So migration to the breeding pool begins in early April in southern Maine and about three weeks later here in the northern part of Maine. They take up to two years to reach maturity and have been known to live in the wild up to 12 years in the wild and growing anywhere between four to five inches. That's, so, that's why it's so vitally important. It takes two years after they're born to be able to reach maturity, to be able to reproduce again. So if they're killed any time between now and that first two years, we've lost great breeding opportunities. As I had mentioned earlier, they're part of the mole family, which means you're virtually not gonna find them unless you're digging them up or turning over logs or, or lifting debris. Um, because what they'll do is they, they, they live underground, just like a mole. That's why they get the name mole salamanders. They're, they inhabit uh, even trenches made by moles and so on. And they have a very unusual defense posture, which means if they feel threatened, what they'll do is they'll literally raise their tail up and wiggle it back and forth so that the predator will go after the tail because of the movement, snap the tail off, the salamander will run away, and regrow the tail later. So in the state of Maine right now, unfortunately, they're listed as concerned. That's due to habitat loss, climate change, and disruption of vernal pools. Here's a spotted salamander. This spotted salamander are the most abundant in central Maine. They prefer uh, deciduous or mixed woods in which there is slow moving streams or vernal pools. They have very sticky tongues and eat a variety of invertebrates, including worms, spiders, slugs, crickets, centipedes, and millipedes. These are all the leaf eaters. Remember when we went back and they're, they're the carbon, uh, carbon regulators because they're eating these type of invertebrates. And if the simple thing is if you eliminate the leaf eaters, you allow the leaves to grow, they absorb the carbon dioxide, re-emit oxygen, and we stay healthy. Again, they are also part of the mole family and they can grow up to five to seven inches long and they can regrow body parts from organs to limbs. While they only have a 10% survival rate, 
when they're born and in the water. Once they, they change into adult form, and if they are left alone, they can live up to 20 to 30 years in the wild. And right now in the state of Maine, they're least concerned. But they are a cutie. And believe it or not, this, this photograph came from uh, Chewankee Foundation. And it happened to be that this salamander was hibernating in one of their tarps that was then transported into one of their warehouses for the, the winter. And they were unrolling it to get it better organized in their in their shed and this little uh little uh friend popped out and i think he was smiling happy to be out here's a very unique and exciting if you ever happen to have the opportunity to come across this is called an eastern newt um the eastern newt has is from an adult are found in relatively any permanent pond in woodlands, gravel pits, farms, orchards, and shallows. Unlike the vernal pool, which is a seasonal thing, these require more where the water's gonna stay permanently. Um, but then again, be fish free, like a vernal pool. And elves are found in woodland areas, generally in the same area. Um, newts can be found every in every county in the state of Maine. In the F stage, they will spend two to seven years it on land growing to two to three inches. This uh, photograph is of an F. Um, that is the juvenile stage right after the lava. Then there's a juvenile and then there's the adult. And so what will happen, they have been observed living in the well between 12 to 15 years. And they are keystone predators for eating midge and mos mosquito larvae, which they'll keep it down. And newts, like everyone else, can regenerate eyes and spinal cords, heart, and so on. But what's fascinating, why I get so excited about uh, Eastern newts, is that they have three distinct lifestyles, usually. That is from the, the uh, infant stage of being an, uh, 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 a midge, or not a midge, but a... Um, it, uh, uh, um, into the, well, I'm, I'm looking for the word as a, like a lava stage in the, in the pond where they're swimming around and they're eating up the rest of the mosquito lava. So that's one stage. The second stage is this stage. This is the only stage in which the F will leave the pond is in this stage in their brightly colored red spotted elf stage. They'll leave the water and they'll live on land for, like I said, anywhere from two to seven years and then they'll return. And when they return as an adult back into it, they turn green and they live out the rest of their life in that water source. So they have three very distinct ways of living. Right now in the state of Maine, they're least concerned. So again, we talked about how many native frogs and salamanders live in, in the state of Maine. Well, again, we're very blessed to have nine native frogs and seven native salamanders that for a total of 16, they call Maine home. So let's talk a little more about some of the others. Well, here's the North American bullfrog. The bullfrog is restricted to aquatic habitats, including shallow bays and covers of large lakes or slow moving rivers, streams, and backwaters. Natural and artificial. So if you have an artificial pond, you're likely you can attract a, a uh, bullfrog. They're common throughout the state of Maine, except for the northern part of Maine. And the adults may reach up to eight inches from tip of nose to the vent. The vent is referred to their rear end. They're late breeders, usually June through July. And maturity is reached about four to five years. So once it takes four to five years for them to be able to be able to reproduce again. And they only can live in the wild, usually up to about 10 years. So they have about six years lifespan, a five to six year lifespan to reproduce. They're ambush predators devouring almost any animal that will fit in their mouth, including mice and other small creatures. And the American bullfrog are named because males produce a cow-like mooing sound. And Maine has them listed as least concern. So let's give a listen to what a bullfrog might sound like. So 
So here we have a great tree frog. This species inhabits forest areas near shallow water, water is not often seen at the edge of the water, is not often seen at the edge of water, but rather in the purchase of, of the trees and shrubs. So this is a tree frog, just like the, when we talked about the spring peepers, they're not gonna be, you're not gonna normally find them right in the water, you're gonna find them perched on, on twigs or branches and so on. The same goes for the, the wood frog. And in Maine, it's the most common in Southern and Central portion of the state and twice as big as spring peepers, two and a half inches, and they can live up to eight years in the wild. They are also late breeders compared to most other frogs found in the state of Maine, waiting until the air temperature reaches 68 degrees. And during hibernation, 80% of their body freezes and their eyes become opaque as, as breathing and heartbeat are suspended. And they have the loudest call measured for North American uh, and can generate up to 600 to 1400 calls per hour. And right now they're least concerned in the state of Maine. And let's give a listen. Here we have the Northern Leopard Frog. Uh, how many of you remember your high school days in biology where you were asked to dissect a frog? Well, chances are good it was a northern leopard frog. Um, so they are usually anywhere between a medium size, between two to four, and that's a snout to vent, preferring to live in a near a permanent water source such as the stream, lake, marshes, or irrigation streams. They cover the entire state of Maine, but are but in most areas, it's much less common than the pickerel frog. Often confused, the pickerel frog and the northern leopard frog are often confused because of the, dark sp the spots that they have. In the wild, their life expectancy could be anywhere from five to eight years. And they have two space um, dark spots that in the pattern of their dorsal. And they are unique in the fact that they can clear spans of eight feet in a single leap that is 15 times their body length. And they will have three distinct calls, either an advertisement call saying, hey, here I am, let's mate. Here's a release call when males will mate males. Uh, they will get confused in the mating process and they will attempt to mate with other males. And so they have a particular call designed just to say, hey, uh, I'm not who you're looking for, leave. And then they have a warning call that says, hey, somebody's walking around or somebody's here that shouldn't be here. So they have those. So right now they are special concern because these were highly sought after, as I mentioned, for biology classes and also for menus in the restaurant industry for frog legs. <sighs> As I mentioned to you before, the space, the black spots on the back of the dorsal were kind of helter-skelter. They are not uniform. If you need to know if you have a pickerel versus a leopard frog, the spots on the back are going to be more uniform. So the pickerel, for, pickerel frog is more apt to be found around hilly springs, uh, ravines, and even sphagnum moss. This one was found on my property in a sphagnum moss, and the pickerel frog is widespread in the state of Maine, emerging from hibernation in late April or early May, and then begin the breeding process. They're bronze in color with two hand-drawn parallel rows of square spots down the back. That's how you tell. They're bronze. The leopard frog was green. The leopard frog spots are uneven. The pickerel frog is bronze and the spots are even. That's how you can tell. They're an indicator species. You're not going to find a pickerel frog anywhere where there's a polluted water system. Just isn't going to happen. So that's a good way to know that if you once had pickerel frogs and then you haven't seen any for a while, you might want to look at your water system because that's what they're indicating. So what do you know? Imagine a pickerel frog fisherman has fallen asleep, so he is snoring. That is what a pickerel frog sounds like. 
And right now in the state of Maine, they're least concerned. But this, let's give a listen and see if you agree that it sounds like a fisherman sleeping. Here's a unique uh, species that we have here in the state of Maine. It's called a mink frog. It's also called the frog of the north, meaning 40 to 3 degrees uh, latitude north. They are almost aquatic, exclusively aquatic, venturing only on land during immediate and after a heavy rainfall. You will find them around ponds and lakes and streams, preferring, preferring shallow water with floating lily pads and pickerel reeds. They're medium sized, anywhere from two to three inches long. A frog breeding in the spring and early summer, and they have been known to live up in the wild up to about six years. Their skin, this is where they get their name, their skin produces a musty odor like a mink when handled. And their diets consist of spiders, snails, beetles, and other invertebrates. The mink frog makes a rapid tap, tap, tap. That sounds of like representing two pieces of wood being tapped together. And right now, we're fortunate that they are least concerned. So let's give a listen to what they may sound like. Here's our green frog. This is not Kermit, but it is our green frog that we find, which seldom ventures far from water and can be typically found on the shores and banks of ponds and lakes and streams and water. Green frogs are common throughout the state of Maine, and they green frogs can live up to 10 years in the wild. But how you can tell a difference between a green frog and a bullfrog because they almost look dead on spot the same is this, if you look right behind the eye there's a lateral ridge running down to its vent what that ridge is an indicator of it's that's a green frog that you have and not a bullfrog it is absence on the bullfrog and it's present on the green frog and the frog it's got its name because it's a frog that cries loudly we'll give a listen to that in just a few minutes seconds so we are most familiar with the plucking sounds of a loose banjo string that green frogs make, but they can also produce up to six different calls. And right now they're enjoying the least concerned status here in the state of Maine. And they sound like... <coughs> So just getting away a little bit from the frogs and just highlighting a few of the northern uh, two-line salamanders or salamanders that I have. Here's a northern two-line salamander uh, that are common at the edge or even small permanent brooks, but also occur on shorelines of larger rivers, small brook edges. And if you're going to look for them, look for rocks that are about six inches in diameter. Flip the rock over and you may see them scurry away and that's the easiest habitat you can find them in. They're also abundant statewide in virtually in every mainstream and watershed. They are the smallest of the salamanders, only two, to, two and a half to three and a half inches. And, but most abundant of the three main uh, spring salamanders, these are your brook salamander, your dusty and your spring salamander. So they are the most uh, uh, abundant of those. And maturity is reached around two years. And breeding occurs in the fall, winter, or spring. And in the spring, they lay anywhere from 12 to 36 eggs and are cemented to a cluster of rocks, a cluster, cemented in a cluster to under the side of the rocks. So what they'll do is they'll, they'll get into a stream or so on. And in order to protect their eggs, they'll lay their eggs on the underside of the rock and that will protect them from their predators. And so when their hiding places revealed, they will dash away using their, their legs, 
But rather than wiggling and undulating like a tiny yellow black snake into the water or under another, another rock. And these are ones, these are salamanders that stay active year round. They will even stay active in the winter. Unfortunately, they have a concerned status here in Maine. Here's the northern redback salamander. They are almost entirely terrestrial salamanders in Maine in living um, in, in forests and mixed forests, growing up to 2.3 to 3.8 inches long. Uh, the northern redback salamander is both very abundant and widely distributed through it. In fact, it is the most abundant salamander found in the state of Maine. And it also happens to be the mascot for the Maine master naturalist. So they have no lungs, so they absorb their oxygen through their moist skin and membranes in their throat. They evade predators by dropping off uh, all parts of their tail. And they spend their winter deep underground, usually 16 to 35 inches down, so they won't freeze. And they are entirely land dwelling, and they won't even go in the water to breed. So that all this occurs on land. So that's what they have. Right now, unfortunately, we have them listed as a concern in the state of Maine. Here's the northern uh, dusty salamander. The dusty salamanders inhibit the moist edges of woodlands and streams in, in springs. They are widespread throughout the state except for the northeastern corner of Maine. Dusties grow darker with age and growing between two and a half to four and a half inches long. Again, they have no lungs and they absorb oxygen through their moist skins and, and membranes in their throat. And members of this family differ from other salamanders and they have, they have no immobile, immovable lower jaw. The dusty must lift the, the, its head in order to open its mouth. So if it wants to open, the jaw will stay down. It has to lift the upper part of its head to open it. And they, again, will remain active all winter long. Unfortunately, they have a concern. So we didn't let you know about this, but we're going to spring a little, uh, little quiz on you and see how many of you had stuck with the program and how many of you had paid attention. So here's going to be the first question. Vernal pools or seasonal pools are unique uh, types of wetland. They are typically A, small, B, fish-free, C, have no permanent inlet or outlet, D, all of the above. Now I ask you to make your selection and then submit. And then Alice will tally the at the end. Go ahead. Are you okay? Look at Did that. They submit all of above. No, I think. You 17. Okay. Can you show the results or not? Alice? Yeah, they're there. Can you see them? See the no, blue line? I didn't get see the blue line all the way across? No. Everyone. I'm not seeing uh, it. Uh, I can okay, see. Okay, good. It. All right, good. Well, you just give me the results then, okay? Uh, well, all, all of, right. 100% of people said all of above. Wonderful. Okay, want to do the next one? Yep, we're going to go right through it. And then the next one is question number two. The big night usually occurs on during a full moon. The first spring night after the ground thaws and the temperatures hover in the 40s. Okay. Alice, I'm going to have okay. Can you see it? Um, March 31st or when there are no cars on the road. Um, I think what I, have, I need for you to do, Alice, is wait till I read all the questions and the answers and then put the quiz up, okay? Okay. Because it, block, it blocked me from doing it. So again, uh, this is question number two. If you want to put those up, Alice, that would be great if you want to put them up. You are, I think you already have, so. They're already up. Okay. 15 said right. 100, uh, B. Excellent, oh. very good. That's the right answer. Okay. 
Okay. All right, I'm gonna read all the questions. I'm gonna read the questions and then the answers. And then if you could put it up, that would be great, okay? Uh, okay. So question number three, name, identify this frog. Oh, there you go, you got your results today. Yeah. Excellent, okay, we're getting there, okay. Is this a gray tree frog? Is this a bee wood frog? Is this a C spring peeper? Or is this a D green frog? What are your answers? Perfect. That is excellent, Alice. Excellent. Mm, lots of answers. Ooh. Good. Well, maybe they can't see him. I'll move it over. Okay. You see oh, the Alice, you're, you're a champ. Look at that. 40% of you got it right. Um, the A, the gray tree frog, the spring peeper, and the green frog, unfortunately, are, are not correct. <laughs> One of the unique characteristics of the wood frog is its mass that it has around its eyes. Kind of similar to what you might find around a raccoon or a robber. They're all referred to as the robber frog because of that mass that they have there around their eyes. So excellent, excellent job. Okay, you ready? Okay, question number four. Identify this salamander. Is it A spotted? Is it B spring? Is it C dusty? Or is it D blue spotted? And if anybody picks D, then my monitor's wrong. Except Jerry will pick D. Yeah, okay, can you see it? We can see it. Uh oh. Uh oh. All set. We're all set. Oh, Jerry, why did you pick blue? Okay, excellent, excellent. <laughs> okay, most of them got it right. Okay, You're the killing fifth and long. final question. Yeah, the fifth and final question. Oops. What is the biggest threat to Maine's native amphibians? Is it A, cars? Is it B, habitat loss? Is it C, climate change? Or is it D, all of the above? Uh, they're all up. Good. I'm letting it go a little longer. Okay, share results. Perfect, look at that. I think we did very well tonight, didn't we, Alice? Yeah, I think so. Everybody did very well. Good we'll job. Have to, we'll have to download those results. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I don't know. Also, again, as I mentioned earlier, my, my interest in wildlife started when I was quite young and has carried over. My wife and I have participated in several programs. Um, prior to moving to Maine here, we participated in what we call a, a black bear project, which we lived in a community, which was the home for 4,000 black bears. Unfortunately, nobody took the time to educate the residents about coexisting with the black bears there. And so we got involved and, and the lesson that I learned from that, why am I sharing this story with you? Well, it's the lesson I learned from that was, um, people are great to hear, we're, we're great to tell you what the problem is, but we're not too often able to tell you what the solution is or what, the, what we can do to help. And this is what you can do. You can become a citizen science in Maine, scientist in Maine, and participate in Maine's Amphibian and Reptile Atlas project, which is called MARAP. 
all of us have phones and all of us have the capability of documenting photographs through that. One of the greatest apps that are out there right now is iNaturalist. You take a photograph of a species that you may be familiar with or you may not be, it doesn't matter. If you are familiar with it and it's a turtle and you know that it's a, it's a painted turtle and you wanna document it anyhow, that goes. And that ultimately will end up with this program called MayRap. MayRap helps identify these species throughout the state of Maine, lets us know the status and the health of them and where they are. This could be an indication of a global warming or climate warming if, if species that are migrating further north that are typically found in Southern Maine, we're now finding in Northern Maine. So again, you're, you're adding very vital information to them. This program was put on by a land trust or a group of friends from Totten Bay, they, they, but you can join or support local or regional land trusts. These are great ways of they are stewards of some of Maine's most special places. And if you happen to have a vernal pool, I mean, I, I think we talked about it. I think Alice has one close by and now Jerry mentioned it. I, I actually invested in our neighbor to build us two. He's a construction worker with the right heavy equipment. And he actually built two vernal pools on our property so that we can give the, our, our amphibians a fighting chance. If you do happen to have a vernal pool or wetland on your property, allow a wider vegetation buffer to grow around the shorelines. And watch for frogs and salamanders, especially this time of year, crossing on warm, rainy nights as they try to make their way to the green pool. We've learned tonight that some of these species take years to, before they get to maturity. And if they're mowed down between now and then, that's just gonna cut it back. And I've also learned that we talked about the various, you know, uh, the massive amount of eggs that are laid there. Something like a, a toad may lay anywhere from 2,000 to 20,000 eggs when they breed. But I've heard and studies have proven that only 20, 20 toads may survive that whole process from 20,000 to 20, only 20 will survive. And that's, they have so many uphill battles that they have to overcome, such as just surviving and not having uh, predators come to their vernal pools and eat the salamander eggs. Or even when they get older, they're gonna have to face a predators or if they have a, uh, they lost their, their vernal pool sites and so on. And, and so many uphill battles, uh, only 20 of them reach maturity. So that's something we can do. So again, this is a little gray tree frog that's adapted to its environment. It is a green tree frog found um, in Hancock County at Long, Long Pond. But what it's basically saying is, Let's get involved before it's too late. But I don't want to end it on a, on, on a negative note. What I do want to do is I want to reach out and thank you all for participating in this. But I also want to say that there are, because of this program, I have met a lot of dedicated people like the two that you have on here tonight, both Jerry and Alice, and the work that they're doing there and the many people around the wildlife centers and rehabilitation centers, and more in particular, the Maine Inland Fisheries and Wildlife Group. They are dedicated to preserving this most precious resource that we have, and that's our Maine wildlife. So with that, do you have any questions for us? And Alice, you can unmute if you like. Uh, yes. If you hey, I, gotta, I just want to jump in, Paul. I'm sorry, Alice. I got to jump in because um, uh, Nick Noyes has asked the question that I wanted to ask you. And I, I'm a nature photographer, as you know. <laughs> but the question is, how how did you take those pictures, Paul? It's it's it's, it's unbelievable, man. I don't know. I'm not sure. <laughs> you gotta, here, you got to give it up. No, he, no. Here, here, here. The truth of it is. I'm a big fan of, uh, of Joel Startori. I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Joel's work and, and, the, and the stuff that he does. 
He's a National Geographic photographer who's dedicated the rest of his life going around to these facilities that I had the great opportunity to visit. And he's photographing all the species, I think maybe it's 8,000, 10,000, whatever. He's doing it in this format. Um, and I have been a, a student uh, and a studier of his work for years. And so when I was able to combine this with my capstone, I said, this is a great opportunity to do it. So the long and the short of it is, how do I do it, Jerry? I have an in-studio lighting system that's portable that I can take to the locations. Um, it has two strobe lights and I use my camera. That's a great opportunity for me to tell you that none of these animals were hurt during any of the photography of this. And when I get into my wildlife, my mammals and my, my birds, they're usually accustomed to um, humans because they are their wildlife ambassadors. But their ambassadors were the only ones who touched them. I never, ever touched these animals on my own. So the only, they came, they're familiar with it. And so that's how I was able to get them. Very cool. Very cool. So again, if you have any questions, uh, hover over the uh, over your screen. You'll see the chat button down below. If you have questions, go ahead and type your questions in, and uh, mm -hmm. and Paul. Will or you can take them off. You can take them off mute too if they want to ask. But that's fine with me. Yeah. You have to unmute yourself. I can't unmute you. <laughs> Again, I, uh, I apologize for the weather. I just, in fact, had a little incident right here just two seconds ago. And that wind has not let up here at all. Uh, any questions? Oh, here's, people are saying they love the program. <laughs> and thank you, Paul. Well, let me, let me, let me, uh, let me end you end with this. Um, just okay, so let's say we're not fortunate. I mean, a lot of times I go over to Crowley Island and I walk there and, and I know there are locations for vernal pools and I'll go there one day and then the next day I go and I see their eggs. I, I never saw them go at night or hop in or, or do whatever they're going to do. But I want to give you a little information about what to look for when you see eggs floating around in vernal pools. Usually the spotted salamander will lay up to about 250 mm -hmm. eggs and they're often attached to twigs and um, outer casting is clear or milky, milky white. And they'll take several weeks and then they'll float up and they'll turn green with algae. And the, the purposes behind that is to camouflage them. A toad, will, on the other hand, will lay anywhere from 2,000 to 25,000 eggs. Mm -hmm. And they're in long strings that occur. And it takes only three to 12 days for, that, for them to, to hatch and become little um, tadpoles. And then they turn into full-fledged toads in about 50 to 50, 65 days. And a wood frog can lay up to a thousand eggs and they usually attach it to a sticker plant in about one week float to the top. And then they also turn green for camouflage purposes. But unlike all the other frogs, the spring peeper will lay one egg at a time, singly. And they'll take a few days to hatch and then two to four months before they become an adult. So if you're out looking and you didn't get the chance to see them, you may know that they were there and you may know that, hey, that was a spotted salamander or that was a, that was a, a, a wood frog or that might have been a, a, a blue salamander, blue spotted salamander. All right, I don't see any more questions. Um, yeah. So I, thanks. I have, I have a question. Oh, good. Yeah. I have a, an ultraviolet fl flashlight, which uh, I, c I will use in looking for caterpillars and various other insects that have ultraviolet coloring. And I wondered whether any of the salamanders or frogs do. What they'll do with the light or? What was it? Is it whether okay it to use up. the light? Whether it shows up there, well, they show up. Coloring. 
That's an excellent question. And I, to be honest with you, I don't know the answer because typically it's never been suggested in the gear that we use. They're usually, usually just your regular um, lights that you use for your headlamps or your uh, handheld flashlights. I don't know. Boy, I can't. I'm trying to recall my conversation with Derek York who is one of the head herpetologists for the state of Maine, if he said like the blue spotted salamander would show up in that, boy, that's an excellent question. I, and I would say that there's a possibility some of the salamanders might, I think in particular, maybe the blue spotted one from if I try to recall a conversation I had with you. Good, I'll bring good it along. Question. <laughs> excellent. Yeah, bring it along. <laughs> excellent. Video of. Take the video. Okay, if we have no more questions, thank you so much for joining and thank you, Paul, for a great presentation. We really oh. enjoyed it. You're so, Alice, I think you mentioned while I was lost there with the power outage. You Did you mention when your first big walk is or big night uh, is? It's actually this coming Sunday, uh, <laughs> a little bit of a strange night. It's on Easter night, uh, but I picked it because we have other things going on next week and I wanted to try to do one early in April. Uh, and then, so April 4th, and then the second one is April 22nd. And if you'd like to join us, uh, just uh, email me at info at friendsoftauntonbay.org. And we look forward to having you join us. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Paul. Wonderful. That's some exciting news. And uh, all right. Thank you all. Bye bye now. Okay, bye. Have a good night.